Steve Roach, I've got to go back to the heart of your work on Asia, and the fact is you get off Cathay Pacific long ago and far away at Terminal 1, Hong Kong International Airport, and there was the big Morgan Stanley sign that you personally put up there as you came down the ramp at Terminal Run. Those days are gone. Your new view on the new China. Well, those were the days, Tom. Um, I probably will never go on Cathay Pacific again, sadly. Um, look, China is... Um, clearly uh, uh, embracing a different type of approach to um, the balance between ideology, policy, and economic growth than at any point since I've been covering uh, uh, the country. Ideology is uh, the dominant force uh, under uh, Xi Jinping. Uh, and what has really been disturbing and shocking to some of us is how he's used the ideology to go after the uh, what had been the most dynamic sectors of the Chinese economy, uh, the internet platform companies, uh, and um, uh, at the same time he's doing that. He's he's got this uh, income redistribution, wealth redistribution uh, program called uh, Common Prosperity, and so it's a it's a twin pincher movement mm -hmm. on the dynamism of China. Uh, we all know the growth rate is slowed. Um, I'm not concerned about Evergrande. I think they can definitely uh, manage that. Their zero COVID um, uh, policy is also very restrictive on a short-term basis, but I think they can get through that right. as well. I'm more concerned about the medium to longer term right. of China. I've been positive for uh, decades, and I'm uh, much less so today. Stephen, you helped build the modern Hong Kong. What should be the Western bank response to all this? How does the Western banks adapt and adjust in Hong Kong? Well, being in Hong Kong now uh, and in the future is just like being in um, uh, mainland China. There's there's really no functional difference between uh, you know Hong Kong as a, a Chinese city and uh, operating in Shanghai or uh, Beijing. So to the extent that Western banks are comfortable operating in greater China, uh, you know, Hong Kong still has a good deal of attraction to them. I understand that, um, you know, there's a lot of concern because of the dramatic shift from what Hong Kong had been to what it is right now. But you just have to look at it as another big Chinese city. Stephen, you said you are much less optimistic right now about China's trajectory going forward than you have been in decades. Can you play out what the ramifications are at a time when you see inflation is becoming more entrenched and we see supply chains that originate in China becoming more and more disrupted? Well, the supply chain uh, issue, Lisa, is, is, is clearly um, uh, critical to uh, the inflation outlook and so much of the global supply chains uh, run through through China that uh, any disruptions there, as we've seen, have uh, a critical bearing on the supply side uh, of um, you know most uh, large goods producing markets around the world. But um, you know, and I, I wrote about this you know a few years ago when I first warned of uh, stagflation. But little did I know what was going to happen on the demand side. Um, the supply, the supply side was very fragile, to be sure, but the demand side went into lockdown, and then the post-lockdown snapback, fueled by the Fed, who is now desperately behind the curve, uh, really over overstripped uh, 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 what a limited supply side uh, could produce. So the result is, um, you know, very high inflation rate, uh, and the lowest fed, uh, real federal funds rate. Uh, in recorded history, a federal funds rate today that is further into negative territory than it was in the 19, uh, mid 1970s and early 1980s when we had uh, a terrific, uh, or a, should, I should say, a horrific uh, inflation problem. So to say the Fed's behind the curve is uh, 
putting it uh, very kindly. Well, Stephen, uh, to build on that and to go back to your idea where you said the demand side was rather unexpected and it plays to this elegant mea culpa that you wrote last year uh, in August in uh, Project Syndicate where you talked about how your call for a double dip recession didn't come to fruition because of this. How do you gauge the forecasting, the potential for forecasting errors at such an unprecedented time, which the Fed is grappling with as well? Fair point. Um, look, you can't even forecast the forecasting errors, Lisa. They're so far off the map. Uh, I was just reading an article a few minutes ago about you know how some of the best uh, sort of real-time uh, high-frequency forecasters missed the employment um, uh, numbers last Friday by a factor of two, three, and four. And, you know, forecasting is always hazardous, especially as Yogi told us, when it involves the future, yeah. but this time is ridiculous. Steve Roach, uh, Ellen Zatner came very close to nailing that forecast at Morgan Stanley. And I want to talk, as Lisa mentions, about all the missed calls that were made in the pandemic. We need to look forward. You own the high ground on the macroeconomic analysis of savings. When you hear people talk about, we have an abundance of savings, or they talk about, we're using our savings up too quickly. How do you respond to what that means for 2024? Well, I'm, I'm looking at it again right now, Tom. Uh, what I prefer to look at is um, the overall domestic savings rate, which is the sum of um, business, household, and government dissavings reflecting these large deficits. I look at it in net terms because I want to take out the depreciation that goes for the wear and tear of capital stock. And so I look at the net domestic savings rate as a gauge for how we can domestically fund uh, economic growth going forward. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's exceptionally low. It's about uh, running about 2% uh, over the last uh, year, ticked up a little bit uh, to um, uh, slightly above 3% in the third quarter of uh, last year. But, um, you know, that, that's less than half uh, the average uh, net domestic savings rate in the final three decades of the 20th century. So lacking in saving uh, and wanting to invest and grow, we have to import surplus savings from abroad. We run these massive current account deficits to attract the capital. Um, and that will eventually, not last year, as I another uh, bad forecast of mine, uh, incorrectly felt that the current account would put pressure, uh, downward pressure on the dollar, but that's coming. Hold on, you will see it.